Okay, are we done? Jason, tell me. Pick any one you want. Tell me. Yeah. He wants DX for the blue question mark. Nah, you know it now. Okay, I think that's this one here. There we go. You got it, right? DX is a variable. It's how much change in the current interval, right? How much change in the current interval. Okay, Alyssa, pick another one. Want anything you want? Delta X. I think that's this one. Okay. Yes, Alyssa, pick any one you want. Current interval, I think that's this. Come on, three for three. That's a guess. Which ones are which? Winston. Yeah. Complete intervals. Okay. Lydia. Four, five left to choose from. Huh? This one here? Indeed, starting value of X for accumulation. Okay. Veronica. You guys are making me work for it here. <laughs> Taking me all over the place. <laughs> no, that's great. Ah, I blew it. This one. Did you get it? Yeah. Exact rate is our changing rate function. Okay. Keep going here, Jason, again. Um, so the red question mark, uh -huh. that's like left of X. <laughs> <laughs> and what is, so how about this? What is left of X? What is exactly what? Yeah, go for it. Starting x value of the current interval. The beginning x value of the current interval, right? Okay. Uh, what's left? This step function. What's the step function? Approximate rate. Okay. And then, important question we keep asking over and over again if we have this perfect, beautiful rate function, why do we make the step function this bad? You know, bad, inaccurate function. If we have the perfect exact rate function. Oh, there's something that what's that? What is it, Ranka? X. Current value of X. Okay, we got them all now. Okay, why do we do? Why do we make this bad, inaccurate, bad approximation, chunky step? version of the rate function if we have the perfect, exact, accurate rate function. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jason. Um, when you use the exact rate function, you have to calculate in like little moments. Okay. And using approximate rate, you would use it by like, you'd have constant rates within um, delta x intervals, which would give you like an estimate on accumulation. Right, how do we get the estimates on accumulation? How do we get that then? That's the next question, right? Yes, yes. We have, with constant rates, we can estimate accumulation. And how do we do that? What's the key to that? We use the, the confirmation function for approximation. Mm -hmm. um, we use the angular distinction. Mm -hmm. the, and then we add up all those uh, approximations together to get the, the total. Good. Right. So he's saying dy equals m dx, right? So with those constant rates, we can take the constant rates times whatever change in x we have, and that gives us a little change in accumulation. And then we can add them all up, right? We add them all up, and that's accumulation, right? Accumulation means it's getting bigger little by little, right? It's accumulating. So we, we keep a running total of our changes in y, and that's, in essence, building an accumulation function, right? Cool. So let's, what was the example that we used that you guys had the RV function? Anyone have that information handy for that last problem? No, for, for your question and homework. No, that was the, that was the basketball. Oh. Did you use that one instead? Yes. So. Is there like the step function for accumulation? Is there like 
Yeah, right. So there's something right here. Here. Use this one for the written homework, right? Did I did that make clear? Alyssa's saying yes, yeah. Jason's saying yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm doing a new file here. Everything's so chunky. So it's too big. Okay, and so then it was what? Delta X intervals were 0.65, is that right? Yes. And I asked you to what, approximate the accumulated when X. Okay, so the 2.8 is X. Okay, so now what would A be? Zero. You agree with that, everyone? And uh, okay, and x was two point eight. So let's just pause it here. How many? And then so. A is zero. X is two point eight. So how many intervals? How many? Intervals do we have if delta x is 0.65 and x is 2.8? Let's come up with she wants four completed, and then x would be in the, the fifth interval, you would be the current interval. People are nodding, good. So let me just make the picture look like that, even though the numbers aren't right. So one, two, three, so something like this. So is that four plus one? Okay, so four completed intervals, current interval, and the delta x equals 0.65. Okay, what is left of x? Two point six. What did I say? I guess 2.6, agree with that? Okay. Left of x is 2.6, dx is? Which is? 0 0.2. All right. What else is there? We know the we know the uh, our f function. <coughs> so that's right. That's our r so r sub v. So this be this is really r sub v. Okay. And so then, in order to do this, what do we need to do? Right. Very good. So we need each. We need four constant rates here. So how can we express that constant rate? So I'm going to use, let GC do most of the work here. How can I express this constant rate? She wants RV of zero. Agree? This constant rate is. And I should say this is RV of zero, right? It's not. This bar is an RV of zero, right? It's a bunch of. This is a bunch of points all having the y value of rv of zero. Okay, and then next one is rv of 0.65, and then Okay, and you guys know this is the wrong function. These are not really 0.65. I'm just drawing on this particular drawing, right? And then the last one And then the current interval. And then we want to get the accumulated amounts. 
at that x value, approximate, at x equals 2.6, what do we do? Alyssa, what do we do? So I've got all my constant rates, my approximate rates. I've got my delta x is 0.65, my dx is 0.2. What should I type in here so it'll do it for me here? RV of 2.6. That's a capital V. Okay. What else? So that's the rate in the current interval, right? What do I need to do with that? What do I need to do with that? So I want to write an expression that gets me the, the volume Let's say, what, uh, 2.6? 2.8. At 2.8? So I'll call that V sub 2.8. So I want to write an expression that's going to get me this volume at 2.8. So RV of 2.6 is part of it. What do I, what's up with this RV of 2.6? We're going to accumulate changes in oil. How do we get each change in oil or each, each additional amount of oil? Okay, but in general, how do we calculate how much oil we have, say, for any segment or any interval? How are we going to get an accumulation of oil from rate? Right, so what, should, what would this be? At this rate, how much change do we have? Times 0.2, right? And then? Plus? Whatever, doesn't matter. Addition is commutative, right? So you want to do 1.95? Yeah. Agree? <laughs> what? Because that's what you always want. You want half of your number inside the parentheses and half out. Nice little corrector for you. All right. Then? 1.3? Okay. Ah, uh, what the heck was that? And? Getting close here. And? And now how do I, how do I get to know the value? So I've signed it to this V sub 2.8. How do I get the value of V sub 2.8? Just type it in, right? It will tell me what it is. In theory. Yeah. Did you use GC to do it? Did you get out a handheld and <laughs> GC guys? You never you should use a handheld again. GC for everything. It's the best, right? It does it so much better. Get out of the habit, right? Get in the habit of using GC. I think if you're in this class, I think you get it for life after this. I think they've got an arrangement where you can have it for your teaching. So, yeah, so just get in the habit of using GC. And is this the value that you got? Yeah. Okay. So, just how, it's just how many decimal places I have it, big things I have it set to. So, if you got 32 point, almost 33.9 something, then you got it. You're good. Questions on this? Okay, so today, 
what do we say? We we came up with an accumulation function that was like piecewise, piece by piece, and it was piecewise linear. But we said if you have lots of intervals, then you're gonna have to have one of those, right? One of those linear equations and the piecewise function for every single interval. So our goal today is write write this approximate accumulation function in one line, okay? In one line. And when it comes down to it, okay, so I'll just and so what is all this? Say it loud, louder, Jason. That's right. Accumulation from completed intervals. And then this is? It's not the current interval. Accumulation in the current interval so far. The, the one line accumulation function, it's kind of complicated and there's lots to remember and it's very, there's lots of details and it's, it's kind of hard the first time. But here's the key. It's basically this. The one line accumulation function basically does this. Veronica, I'm up here. It's okay. It adds up all the accumulation from what? And how do you get the accumulation in each completed interval? m dx, or delta x, m delta x plus m delta x plus m delta x plus m delta x, and then a little bit more accumulation from the current interval, m dx. So as we're, as we're trying to you know, keep track of all this stuff that's going on in order to write this one line accumulation, in the forefront of our thinking, it's always this. It's, it's this. The sum of accumulation from completed intervals plus a little more accumulation from the current interval. That's what it's going to do. So always keep that in mind. All right, so let's do it. Are you ready? You've got your full attention. It's a little bit hard at first. And then your next project is the big one for the semester. And it's, I'll show you at the end of, hopefully we get to it by the end of class. All right, so where do I want to be? I want to be here. Ready. So we're doing. You know how fast a quantity's value is changing at every moment. You want to know how much we have at every moment, right? That's what the problem we've been working on. So here's a here's a, just a pause, a screenshot of this file we've been looking at, right? So now I want to know how much do we have at x equals six point seven five based on the approximate rate function, okay? So now we're using r sub f as the actual rate function and r the step function is the r function, and then we're at x equals 6.75. Okay, how much do we have at x equals 6.75? <laughs> so this is what we're doing, right? So let's fill it in. Fill in the blanks. <laughs> r of blank times delta x plus r of blank times delta. This is just what we did, right, in our homework. So what should this first one be? r of what? I heard zero and A. A, right? That's the X value at the left side of the first interval. So we want R of A, delta X. Okay, now, what is the X value at the left side of the second interval? A plus DX. A plus delta X. What's DX, What's DX, Jason? Yeah, are we in the current interval? No. no. All right, okay, next. So now we need the left side, the X value at the left side of the third interval, which is? A plus? Two delta X. And then finally, the left side of the current interval will be? Three delta x, right? Good so far. Yeah. Okay, so now we need a general formula for those for those uh, if input values into R. We need a general formula for that. Right. We got change in complete intervals, change in the current interval, right? Change from completed intervals. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna have an index called J. J is gonna be for the completed intervals, and the value of J is which current interval we're in. So we've got three. So here for this first interval, J equals one, and then J equals two for the second interval, and J equals three for the third interval, right? So what we're looking for is a formula that gets us the left side of the J interval. We need a formula that gets us the left side of the J interval, right? So when it's the first interval, it's just A. When it's the second interval, it's A plus delta X. And when it's the third interval, A plus two delta X. What would the, how about the, uh, if there were lots of complete intervals, what would the 17th interval, what would be the left side of the 17th interval? A plus 16 delta X. Why? Because to get to the seven, to get to the left side of the 17th interval, how many intervals do you have to go across? 16. You go across the 16, and now you're at the start of the 17th. So can you come up with a formula for the jth interval? So what's the x value at the start of the jth interval? She wants a plus j minus 1 delta x. Some nods over here. Does that make sense? Jason, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see, what do the x values need to express the rates for the completed intervals? Express the x value for the rate in the jth complete interval. I think we just did it. The x value for the rate in the jth completed interval is? A plus? J minus 1, delta x is, right? So we're going to start at A, and we're going to go across the first J minus 1 intervals, and now we'll be at the start of the Jth interval. That's why we go J minus 1, delta x. Okay, what is the x value for the rate in the current interval? So what, what would that be? So in the current, so what... Uh, no, the x value to get the rate in the current interval would be that right there. So if there are j number of intervals, it would be? You said all of them. I'm going to go across all of the complete intervals. Not number of all. Total number of, what's that I'm going to say? Total number of. Yeah, so J doesn't have, J doesn't relate to the current interval. Because J is keeping track of how many completed intervals, right? So J is 1, and then J is 2, J is 3. J is not this number. This number is not J. J changes. First J is the first one. Then J is 2. Then J is 3, etc. Then J is... Make sense? So this has nothing to do with J. But that number of complete, the number of intervals that we have to go across to get to the left side of the current interval is all of them, all of the completed intervals. Make sense? Okay, so imagine that the current value of x is in the 101st interval rather than in the fourth interval. Can you express a of 6.75? So in that picture that I showed you before, x is in, it's, it's somewhere in the middle of the 101st interval. So I want you to express a of 6.75 if that's the case. That again. That's better. Okay, go. Work on this. How could you express A of 6.75 if the current value of X, basically, current value of X, 6.75, right? The current value of X is 6.75. If that's in the 101st interval, 
was to express a at 6.75. See if you can write it down. We'll think about it and talk about it. Delta x, right? Rate times delta x. So we're going to be adding up what? 100 of those, and then how many of these? Still one of these, right? So there's a couple of different ways to do that. One way, because we don't have room to do that, and we don't have a lot of time to do that. But how, we still want to express it. So what's one way to express that? So I could start with the first one. What's the first one? Times delta x, right? Plus r of delta x times, right? And then we say what? Continue on like this until hundred delta x. Is that right? And is that a completed interval? Is this a complete interval? What is the x value at the start of the hundredth interval? Is it a plus hundred delta x. What's the a value? What's the no, sorry? What's the x value at the start of the hundredth interval? How many intervals do you have to go across to get to the start of the hundredth interval? No. You beautifully told me this. This. How many? How many intervals do you have to go across to get to the third interval? Alyssa. Two. How many intervals do you have to go across, go across to get to the seventeenth interval? 16. How many intervals do you have to go across to get to the hundredth interval? 99. Right? The last completed interval will start at a plus 99 delta x. Right? But what's the hundred and first? That's the current interval. We're doing the completed intervals, right? So the last completed interval is the hundredth interval, and how do you get to the start of the hundredth interval? You go jump across 99 intervals, right? So now the completed interval would be, or the, sorry, the current interval would be? All, so right, 100 is all the completed intervals, then what? Dx. Sum of the accumulated amounts from the completed intervals plus a little bit more for the partial interval, for the current interval. Okay, so now we're writing the same thing over and over again, right? And, and, and then adding them up. We've got a way to do that without having to write out a few and dot, 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 and more. How do we do that? How do we express? a sum of this, almost the same thing over and over again. No, we, I think it's got to represent all of them. Any, any one of them. J minus one. Times. Okay. And then, but that's just one. We have to add up how many of those? A hundred. How do we do that? Right. J is going to start at one, two, one hundred. But now we're not scared anymore because we know exactly where that, what that is and where it came from, right? It just means first interval, r of a times delta x, right? When j is 1, we get 0, or r of a times delta x. Accumulation for the first interval. Now j is going to be 2. What will we get? 
R of A plus one delta X of delta X. And then, uh, then J is going to be three. And we'll get R of A plus two delta X. So you go across two intervals to get to the third interval. That's delta X. I'm just going to keep doing that and add those up until it gets to J is 100, and we'll have A plus 99 delta X. And then plus. Which is? Uh huh. Times dx. Okay, this is looking an awful lot like now our. We've still got some details to work out, but this is looking an awful lot like the approximate accumulation function in one line. So the details we have to work out are, what if it's just, you know, this is for specifically 100 completed intervals, and it's not a function of x yet, right? It's not a function of, where's the function of x, where's the current x value going to come into this? Is it going to come in, current x value going to come into completed intervals? Where is it going to come into here? dx, right? dx is going to be? What is dx using x? Oh, almost. x minus? What do we call that, right? The x value at what? The start of the current interval. Left x. That's dx, right? x, the current value of x minus left x would be dx. Now it's, so now we're getting close here. So now we got it as a function of x. But the last thing is, it's not necessarily going to be 100 completed intervals. As x increases, that number of completed intervals is going to change too, according to x. So this actually is going to be a function of x too. Right? As x increases, the number of completed intervals will increase. So that will be in terms of x as well. Okay, so we're getting really close. So does the thing I put a cloud around there, does it make sense? What it, and then again, don't lose, lose sight. It all comes back to accumulation in the first interval as mb change in x plus accumulation in the second interval. That's what this is doing. It's adding up a bunch of m delta x's for all the completed intervals plus the m dx for the current interval. Okay, got that? Can I erase? And let's do that. So we, we talked about this. How many complete intervals to reach the current interval? How many? In any case, you know, in any situation, how many complete intervals do we go across to get to the current? No, nope. J is a changing value for the completed intervals. So how many... Of the complete intervals, do we go across to get to the current interval? That three represents what about the completed intervals? Go back to this very elementary situation. Right? So, how many complete intervals is that? No, it's three. Okay. It's three. And how many is three? How many of the complete intervals is three of them? How do we get to the left side of the current interval? How many complete intervals do we jump across? In this case, three. But in any case, how many is it? All of them. We have to go across all the complete intervals to get to to get to the left x, right? To get to the x value at the start of the current interval, all of them. So for the current x interval, the x value is what a plus the total number of 
inflation interval is delta x. We already said that, right? Like our example was a plus 100 delta x. And we said that all equals to what? Or actually, it's the total number. That is left x, right? To get to, if you go a plus the total number of continuing intervals times delta x, you're getting to the x, the x value at the beginning of the current interval. So now I've got to figure out what that is. So left x is this function that, should I put it in the picture then? Let's make it red just like it was before. So right here, that's my left x, right? So what, this is a function of x that takes x, it takes the current value of x and it spits out, gives you the x value at the start of the current interval. That's what left x does. So we gotta figure out what that. So it's basically this, right? So it's basically a plus the total number of completed intervals delta x. So all that's left is to figure out how many total intervals we have given the current value of x. I guess I already had that planned. Where was I? back and forth between apps here. All right. So we got to figure out what is this one runs a little smoother. So here I have a equals 2 and delta x equals 1.8. So our, our last piece of this puzzle is how many completed intervals for the current value of x. So the current value of x is blue there. See that? Let me look back. Kind of confusing. Oh, right there. Okay. Do this. There we go. Okay. So the blue x is marking the current value of x. So how many complete intervals are there from A to the current value of X? Figure it out however you can, okay? Go. How many complete intervals are there from A to the current value of X? Lydia, did you get it? How'd you get it? You counted them. Awesome. You counted them. Love it. Okay, go. How many completed intervals? Now A is 2, delta X is 0.97, and X is 10.549. How many complete intervals are there from A to the current value of X? What's that, Veronica? How'd you get it? You counted them? Okay. Back a little bit. There we go. That's good. So now A is 2, delta X is 0.17, and X is 9.2995. How many completed intervals are there from A to the current value of X? So pretty soon here we're not going to be able to count anymore, so let's pretend we can't count. What's that? You counted? Okay, so. Maybe not that much. A 
about that? There we go. Now delta x is 0.14 and x is 13.137 and a is 2. How many complete intervals are there? Let's figure out how many complete intervals there are. And now counting is not allowed. Can you do it? Do the math. You got it? Okay, we're going to let everyone try. So write out what you thought, Veronica. Can you write it out and figure it out? How many completed intervals from A equals 2 to X is 13.13? X minus A, so you took 13.137. So she took X minus A and divided by delta X. What do you think? People are nodding. And then, so then what did you do after that? So let's, let's do that. So I'm going to... Let's see if I've got, do I have a, okay, so you did 13.137 minus 2 all over 0.14. And then you get 79.55, so how many completed intervals? 79. You're not going to round up? No. The 0.55 represents what? It's kind of like the percentage of the way through the current interval, right? We're like 55% of the way through the current interval. So if it were 79.9, how many completed intervals? So 79. Okay. So there's a mathematical thing, operation that does this. Have you guys seen that before? It, that, that gives you the previous integer, no matter what your decimal is. Well, yeah, it, yes, it, trun it basically truncates off the decimal. But what it's called is the floor function. The floor function gives you how many whole numbers you have at a particular value without any extra. And that's what we want, right? We want completed intervals. So in GC, I'm just going to copy that. You just type in F-L-O-O-R, and then this thing comes up. That thing means whatever's in, inside, it's going to give you the greatest whole number less than your value, right? It's going to give you the truncated value. So now I'm going to, if I take that and I put that expression in that Alyssa told me, look what it returns. Give it a bid. So inside, what's highlighted blue is 79.55, but when you take the floor of it, you get 79. That's exactly what we want. So what's the formula for number of completed intervals? What's the formula? Uh huh? And then? Floor of that. Floor of that. X minus A. Over delta X. The floor of that. And what does that mean again? What does that give us? number of, right? The number of all completed intervals. So now write a formula for left x without looking at your notes. Left x then equals the x value at the start of the interval. How would I get that x value at the start of the interval? Now that I have this it tells me the number of completed intervals. How do I get out to that x value? Starting at zero, what do I do? First I go to A, and then? And then at, for every completed interval, how far do I go? Nope, this is down. Every every complete every interval takes me how far? Delta x. And how many completed intervals do I have? The floor of x minus a over delta x. So the formula is. What is it? A. I'm gonna put that at the end. If that's okay.
there's left x, there's left x function. So the, just the floor by itself gives me how many completed intervals before x. And then this thing, a plus that floor thing times delta x, gives me what? The x value at the start of the current interval. a plus delta x delta x times the number of delta x's, which is all the completed intervals, which is our floor function. Now we can put it all together and we can write the we can write the accumulation function of a one liner. What is AX? AX is accumulation due to completed intervals. Remember this? In essence, what is that? It's a real simple thing. We got lots of variables going on now, but it's a really simple thing. How do we get the accumulation due to completed intervals? We just simply add up all the, and how do we get those? Each one of those is m dx, m times change in x, right? m times change in x, a little bit of change in y, little change in y, little change in y. So for each completed interval, we calculate the dy, right? And then, what else? And so this is this, right? So this is, there's our m times change in x, right? But then for every completed interval, right? So then we have to go through the days to get every completed interval. And we said that was the left side of the j interval, right? That's just the starting value of the left. We figured that out pretty easily. Okay. Then what? It's not plus the current. Yeah, plus the yes, plus something to do with the current interval. Yeah, plus the accumulation in the current interval, which is what was that? Right of right at left of x times dx, right? Right at left of x times dx. So now we know what left x is. What is left x? Well, actually, we're, we're just going to leave it that way. But we need to get this in terms of x. So how do we rewrite dx in terms of x? <clears throat> so what is dx in terms of x? Final minus initial, right? X minus left X. Oh, but we're gonna do that later. How many completed intervals? So J is gonna go from one to the number of completed intervals. How many is that? Good, that's the four. And then our DX we said is X minus left X. Did it? But again, so this is the one line accumulation function. But again, this just goes back to that last homework problem that we did. You're just summing up dy's for the current interval, completed intervals, and then plus a little bit more for the current interval. It's just like their last homework problem. Where do you see function notation in this function? Okay. But that's not function notation. Function notation. Where do you see function notation? Left of x. Anywhere else?
Okay, function notation there. And then what? Here's function notation. Anywhere else? Oh, and then r of left also. That's a composite function, so you got twice you have function notation. Anywhere else? And this isn't function notation per se, but it's, yeah, so we'll just skip that. Can you imagine trying to write this function without function notation? So it's really, really helpful. Right? So we we could we could get rid of the we could substitute left x. We know what left x is, that's not too bad. A plus the floor times delta x. That'd be okay. But we're in desperate need of this right function notation from our approximate rate function. Yeah. And the left x just makes things a lot nicer. But function notation is super helpful and powerful, right? So it is a friend, and that's why I'm trying to emphasize it and use it because I want to get you guys to have the mindset of using function notation. If you're ever doing one of these GC, if you're making an animation, and you keep writing the same formula over and over and over again, this is like, Wait, there's an easier way. What is it? Do you like label it as function of whatever? Make a, define a function, right? And then? And then, like, you can just use that label or that definition. And just function, function notation. Yeah, function notation. Function notation, right? You use this function notation to represent values of that function instead of writing the same formula over and over and over again in, in six, seven, eight lines of your code, right? I'll be very proud of them finish. Okay, so this is sand unloading. What's going on? Okay, sand unloading. So the first view is showing the uh, exact rate function emerging here. Okay, and so, and I'll I'll give you the I'll give you the formula for that. But your whole the whole uh, GC file should work if you change, you know, if you change the rate function, everything will work according to the new rate function. But I'll, I will give you the standard loading function. Okay, so view one is just showing the exact rate. So view two then shows. I don't want the slider. I want it to be to. Point three, I think. We'll try point three. That's fine. Okay. So uh, view one is showing the exact rate. View two shows. What's our next function from there? <coughs> view two shows a static version of the exact rate and now shows the approximate rate emerging or being generated. Okay. You're going to. You're going to need some heavy duty tools, heavy duty tools from what we did today in class. So what we did today in class is, is gives you all the tools to do this. Okay. And from there, what's next? Approximate accumulation. We're going to show that over here, accumulation over in the right graph. Yeah, you're going to write that as a piecewise function in lots of different lines? No, right? Because what am I about to do with delta x? Yes, you're probably right. I'm going to make it smaller. And when I make it smaller, all the intervals get smaller, and I get the new approximate rate function, and this is still a piecewise linear function. What piecewise linear function is it? Approximate accumulation. Where's that going to come from? 
Yeah, it's what we spent the whole day in class on. Awesome. Thank you. Great job. All right. And so then I can I can keep making that smaller. And what happens as I continue to make it smaller? Things get more exact, right? So the, the approximate rate does a better job mimicking the exact rate. And then the approximate accumulation, just little, little teeny segments pieced together, is getting closer to something, right? The approximations get closer to each other. And when you can't tell the difference of approximations apart anymore, when you're making delta x smaller, then you're essentially at yeah, actual exact accumulation. So I'll, I'll make delta x a little bigger again. So view 4 then has the exact accumulation of function. And now I'm showing, but I'm, it shows all four functions. OK, but what so everything we've learned so far this semester, and especially today, is you have everything you need to do this, but you'll have time because this is, this is a challenge. Use functions and function notation. If you find yourself writing the same formula over and over again, you should say, oh, I need to make a function for that. And now instead of repeating that formula, I can repeat function notation every time, right? OK. So uh, you've got this on the video. You can stare at it. And then uh, let's see. Oh, let me show you the, there's the, there's the, the rate function for this unloading sand. So this is a weight. This is rate of change of weight on a scale. And then this is accumulation of weight on the scale in hundreds of pounds. So there's the, this is the, the RW function, the exact rate of change of weight on the scale. The other thing we're working on now is we're going to have a, a project. You're going to do a, um, a three-day lesson plan project. So you'll pair up. And work on a, and that's most of what we'll do through November. But we have to start thinking about what your topic's going to be. So there's a short assignment on thinking about a topic in pre-calculus that you're interested in, something that it lends itself well to GC, like something function oriented. Okay, so you can make some didactic object, objects with GC, and so we'll start thinking about. So that'll be due Thursday. This is think about a, a topic in pre-calculus that interests you. Write up a short page, page and a half, two pages on what you might do for three days to teach that topic. Um, topic. Okay. Yes. It'll be on Canvas. All the details will be on. Okay.